Hello class and welcome to chapter 40, Terrorism Response and Disaster Management. We will discuss EMS operations, knowledge and operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personal safety related to terrorism response and disaster management. At the end of this lecture, you will have foundational knowledge of mass casualty incidents due to terrorism and disaster risk and responsibilities of operating on scene of a natural and man-made disaster. It's possible that you may be called on to respond to a terrorist event during your career. The question will not be when will terrorists strike again, but rather when and where will they strike. You must be mentally and physically prepared for the possibility of a terrorist event. It is difficult to plan and anticipate a response to many terrorist events, yet there are several key principles that apply to every response. Okay, so let's start with what is terrorism? Terrorist forces have been at work since early civilizations. The U.S. Department of Justice defines both international terrorism and domestic terrorism with these points. It involves violent acts or acts dangerous to human life that violate federal or state law and appears to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. One difference between two is location. So international terrorism occurs primarily outside the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, and domestic terrorism occurs primarily within the territorial juris jurisdiction of the United States. Modern-day terrorism is common in the Middle East, where tor terrorist groups have frequently attacked civilian populations. In the United States, domestic terrorists have struck multiple times in previous years. Only a small percentage of groups actually turn towards terrorism as a means to achieve their goals. There are religious extremist groups and doomsday cults, and some of these groups may participate in apocalyptic violence and extremist political groups. They include violent separatist groups and those who seek political, religious, economic, and social freedom. There are also cyber terrorists. They attack a population's technology technological infrastructure as a means to draw attention to their cause, and single-issue groups, which include anti-abortion groups or animal rights groups, anarchists or racists, and even uh, eco-terrorist groups. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about weapons of mass destruction. So a weapon of mass destruction, or WMB, or weapon of mass casualty, or WMC, is any agent designed to bring about mass death, casualty, or mass damage to property and infrastructure, such as bridges, tunnels, airports, or seaports. Be nice, or CBR. NE are mnemonics to remember the kinds of weapons of mass destruction. So B NICE stands for biologic, nuclear, incinerary, chemical, and explosive. Whereas C B R N E stands for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. To date, the preferred WMD for terrorists have been explosive devices. Weapons of mass destruction are relatively easy to obtain or create and are specifically geared towards killing large numbers of people. Chemical terrorism warfare. Chemical agents are manufactured substances that can be devastating effects on living organisms. They can be produced from liquid or powder or vapor form, depending on the desired route of exposure and dissemination technique. And so these agents consist of the following types. Vesicants, which are the blister agents, respiratory agents, which are choking agents, nerve agents, and metabolic agents, which are the cyanides. 
Biologic terrorism or warfare. Biologic agents are organisms that cause disease. They are generally found in nature, but for terrorist use, however, they are cultivated, synthesized, and mutated in a laboratory. The weaponization of biologic agents is preferred to artificially manufacture maximize the target population's exposure to the germ. So the primary types are viruses, bacteria, and toxins. Nuclear radio radiologic terrorism. They have been only two publicly known incidents involving these two use of nuclear device. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is possible for a terrorist to secure radio radioactive materials or waste to um, perpetuate an act of terror. These materials are far easier for a uh, determined terrorist to acquire and require less expertise to use. So dirty bombs can cause widespread panic and civ civil disturbances. So EMT responds to terrorism. So when you respond to a terrorist event, the basic foundations of patient care remain the same. However, the treatment will and uh, can and will vary. Always remember the situational awareness. So recognizing a terrorist event indicators, and this is very important. The planning of most acts of terror is court, which means that the public safety community generally has no prior knowledge of the time, location, or nature of the attack. So you must constantly be aware of your surroundings and understand the possibility of the risk for terrorism. You must know the current level threat level issued by the federal government through the Department of Homeland Security. In April 2011, the color-coded Homeland Security Advisory System was placed by the National Terrorism Advisory System, so the NTAS. Alert from the NTAS contain a, a summary of the threats and the actions that first responders, government agencies, and the public can take to maintain safety. Make sure that you are aware of information sent out by the advisory system at the start of your workday. On every call, make the following observations. So, type of location. Is the location a monument, infrastructure, government building, or religious building? Is there a large gathering or special event? Make note of the type of the call. Is there a report of an explosion or a suspicious device? Are the reports of people fleeing the scene? Make note of the number of patients. Are there multiple victims in a similar signs and symptoms? Is there probably the single most important clue that a terrorist attack or a weapon um, incident involving a WMD has occurred? And victim statements, the second best indication of a terrorist or WMD event pre-incident indicators. So they are, has there been a recent increase in violence or political activism? And are you aware of any credible threats made against the location gathering or uh, occasion? Response accent actions. So scene safety, of course, remember to stage your vehicle a safe distance from the instance. Wait for law enforcement personnel to advise you that the scene is secure and they have made it secure. So if you have any doubt that it is not secure, don't, don't enter. The best location for you to stage is upwind and uphill from the incident. Remember the follow the rules. Failure to park your vehicle at a safe location can place you and your partner in danger. And if your vehicle is blocked in by any other vehicles or damaged by a secondary device, so you will be unable to provide victims with transportation. Now, a secondary device um, is the following. So terrorists have been known to plant additional explosives that are set to explode after the initial bomb. So this type of secondary device is intended primarily to injure just the responders and to secure media coverage. So secondary devices may include various types of electric equipment such as cell phones or pagers. Okay, so this figure shows a slide of an example of a ambulance uh, safely staged uh, or parked far um, outside of the of, of the accident. Okay, so responder safety or personal protection. So the best form of protection from a WMD 
um, is preventing yourself from coming into contact with it. So the greatest threats facing you in a WMD attack are contamination and cross-contamination. So um, contamination with an agent occurs when you have direct contact and cross-contamination occurs when you come in to contact with a contaminated person who has not yet been deconned. Okay, so contamination is direct contact and cross-contamination is when you come into contact with somebody who has been not yet deconned. Okay, so notification procedures. So what you should do is um, notify the dispatcher when you suspect a terrorist or WMD. So you need to inform dispatch of the nature of the event, any additional resources that need to be required, the estimated number of patients, the upwind route of approach and optimal route of approach. You also need to um, um, make sure it's in stream, extremely important to establish a staging area where other units will be able to converge. So be mindful of access and and exit routes when you direct units to respond to the location. So train responders in uh, the proper protective equipment are the only persons uh, equipped to handle the WMD incident. And keep in mind that there may be more than one type of device or agent present. Establishing command. As the first provider on scene, the EMT may need to establish command until the additional personnel arrive. You and other EMTs may function as the medical branch directors, triage supervisors, treatment supervisors, transportation supervisors, logistic officers, command and general staff. And these are all the different positions we uh, talked about in the last chapter. So if the instinct Initial instant command system is already in place, however, immediately speak to the staging medical officer to receive your assignment. Reassessing scene safety. It is every EMT's responsibility to cons constantly assess and reassess the scene for safety. It is an important component of situational awareness. Chemical agents. Now, chemical agents are liquids or gases that are dispersed to kill or injure. The characteristic of an agent can be described as liquid, gas, or solid material. Now, persistent or non-volatile agents can, main, can remain on the surface for long periods of time, usually longer than 24 hours. So non-persistent or volatile agents evaporate rapidly when left on a surface in in the optimal temperature range. So non-volatile remain for long times, volatile uh, evaporate very rapidly. Okay, Route of exposure is a term used to describe how the agent most effectively enters the body. So agents with a vapor hazard enter the body through a respiratory tract in the form of vapors. And agents with contact hazard or skin hazard give off very little vapor or no vapors and they enter the body through the skin. Vesicants or blister agents. The primary route of exposure of blister agents or vesicants is the skin contact. However, if vesicants are left on the skin or clothing long enough, they produce vapors that can enter the respiratory tract and cause burn-like blisters to form on the skin and the respiratory tract. So these agents consist of sulfur mustard, leucite, phosgene, the vesicants usually cause the most damage to damp or moist areas on the body, such as armpits or groin or the respiratory tract. Signs of an of vesicant exposure on the skin include all of the following. So skin irritation, such as burning or reddening, immediate intense skin pain, formations of large blisters, gray discoloration of the skin, swollen or closed or irritation eyes, permanent eye injury, including blindness. If vapors are inhaled, the patient may experience these signs and symptoms, hoarseness or strider, severe cough, coughing up blood, or severe dyspnea. Sulfur mustard. 
is a brownish yellow oily substance that is generally considered very persistent. As the agent is absorbed into the skin, it begins an irres irreversible process of damage of cells. Now, mustard is considered a mutagen, which means it mutates, damages, and causes the structure, it changes the structures of the cells. The patient will experience a progressive reddening of the effective area, which is generally developed into large blisters. Mustard also attacks vulnerable cells within the bone marrow and depletes the body, uh, body's ability to produce white blood cells. So sulfur mustard vapors can be inhaled, creating upper and lower airway compromise. Leucocyte and phosgene produce blister wounds very similar to that of, caused by mustard. So these agents produce immediate intense pain and discomfort when contact is made. The patient may have a graze to discoloration at the contaminated site. Vesicant agent treatment. There are no anti antidotes for mustard or CX exposure. British anti-leucite leucidite is the antidote for Agent L. However, it is not carried by civilian EMS. Ensure that the patient has been decontaminated before you initiate any treatment. If the agent has been inhaled, the patient may require prompt airway support as soon as decontamination is complete. Transport should be initiated as soon as possible. Generally, burn centers are best equipped to handle the wounds and subsequent infections produced by vesicants. Pulmonary agents, such as choking, they're also known as choking agents. Pulmonary agents are gases that cause immediate harm to persons exposed to them. This includes chlorine and phosgene. They produce respiratory-related symptoms such as dyspnea and tach tachypnea. The primary route of exposure is through the respiratory tract, which makes them an inhalation and vapor hazard. One once inside the lungs, they damage the lung and fluid leaks into the lungs. Pulmonary edema develops, resulting in difficulty breathing because of severely impaired gas exchange. Chlorine was the first chemical agent ever used in warfare. Initially, it produces upper airway irritation and choking sensation. The patient later experiences these signs and symptoms, shortness of breath, chest tightness, hoarseness and strider, gasping and coughing. With serious exposures, patients may experience pulmonary edema and complete airway obstruction and then death. Phosgene has been produced for chemical warfare and is a product of combustion such as might be produced in a fire. Phosgene is a very potent agent that has a delayed onset of symptoms, usually hours. The odor produced by the chemical is similar to that of a freshly mowed grass or hay. So the results in is that much more of a gas may enter the body unnoticed. Initially, a mild exposure may include signs and symptoms such as nausea, chest tightness, severe cough, dyspnea on exertion. So pulmonary edema may be so severe that the patient continually coughs, coughs up white or pink tinged fluid. Severe exposure produces such large amounts of fluid in the lungs that the patient may initially become hypovolemic and subsequently hypotensive. Pulmonary agent treatment. The best initial treatment is to remove the patient from the contaminated atmosphere. This should be done by trained personnel and proper PPE. Aggressive management of the ABC should be initiated, paying particular attention to oxygenation, ventilation, and suctioning if required. Do not allow the patient to be active. There is no antidotes to counteract the pulmonary agents. The primary goal is to perform the ABCs, allow the patient to rest in a position of comfort with the head elevated and initiate rapid transport. If the patient condition does not improve and basic airway support, consider requesting advanced life support to intercept. Continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, may benefit some patients. Other may require advanced airway management.
Next, we're going to talk about nerve agents. So nerve agents are among the most deadly chemicals developed, and they're classified as weapons of mass destruction. They're not readily available to the general public. They're extremely toxic and readily fatal with an uh, any route of exposure. So nerve agents can cause cardiac arrest within seconds, two minutes of exposure. Nerve agents are a class of chemicals called organophosphates, which are found in household bug spray, um, agricultural pesticides, and some industrial chemicals at much lower strengths than in the weaponized form. So organophosphates block an essential enzyme in the nervous system, causing the body's organs to become overstimulated and burn out. G agents come from the early nerve agent, the G series. So sarin, GB, is a highly volatile, colorous and odorous liquid. LD, which is a standard measurement that represents the amount that will kill 50% of the population's exposure at this level. So about one drop, especially dangerous in enclosed environments. When it comes in contact with the skin, it is quickly absorbed and evaporates. When it is on clothing, it, is, it has the effect of off-gassing. So SOMAN, S-O-M-A-N, it's twice as persistent as sarin and five times as lethal. This agent is a contact and an inhalation hazard. A unique additive in GB causes it to bind to cells and to attack faster than any other agent. Then there is GA. GA is approximately half as lethal as sarin and 36 times more persistent. It is a contact and an inhalation hazard. Then there is the V agent, um, VX. So it is a clear oily agent and has no odor. It looks like baby oil. It is more than a hundred times more lethal than sarin and is extremely persistent. It is easily absorbed onto the skin and it has an oily residue that remains is extremely difficult to decontaminate. And this slide compares the different nerve agents and what I just discussed. So nerve agents all produce similar symptoms, but have far varying routes. So the symptoms are described using the military mnemonic sludge, M. And so this stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastric, upset and cramps, emesis, muscle twitching. The medical mnemonic dumbbells is used uh, to describe diarrhea, urination, meiosis or muscle weakness, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, seizures, salivation, or sweating. Okay, so meiosis is the most common symptom of a ner nerve agent exposure and can remain for days to weeks. So it's uh, seen quickly in vapor exposure. It may occur later after isolated skin exposure. The patient may have been exposed to both. And so a nerve agent treatment so fatalities from severe nerve agent exposure occur as a result of respiratory complications, which lead to respiratory arrest. So you can greatly increase the patient's chances of survival simply by providing airway and ventilate, ventilatory ex, uh, support. So often in patients exposed to these agents, seizures will begin and uh, will not stop. So these patients will require administration of a nerve agent, which uh, are antidote kits, and medical treatment may include so we use the Duo Dot. It's an auto injector, and it contains 2.1 milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of the um, uh, chloride. It's a promal p r a l i d o x i m e chloride. So it's called 2-PAM and is delivered in a single dose through one needle. The military form is a, an antidote treatment. It's a nerve agent auto injector. It's called ATNAA. So if your service carries a nerve agent antidote, refer to your local protocol for dosage and usage information. So meta metabolic agents, so the cyanide, so hydrogen cyanide or um, cyanogen chloride, 
are both agents that affect the body's ability to use the oxygen. So cyanide is a colorless gas with an odor sm that's similar to almonds. So cyanide smells like almonds. Effects of cyanide begin on a cellular level and are very rapidly seen at the organ and system level. So these deadly gases are commonly found in many industrial settings such as gold and silver mining, photography, and plastic processing. They are often present in fires associated with textile and plastic factories. So in low doses, these chemicals are associated with dizziness, lightheadedness, headache, and vomiting. High doses will produce symptoms that include shortness of breath and gasping respirations, respiratory distress or arrest, tachypnea, flesh skin, and tachycardia altered mental status, seizures, coma, apnea, and then cardiac arrest. The cyanide treatment agent agent treatment so cyanide bonds to the body's cells and it prevents oxygen from being used. So once trained personnel wearing the proper PPE, of course, have removed the patient from the source of exposure, all the patient's clothes must be removed to prevent off-gassing in the ambulance. So the patient must be deconned by trained personnel before initiating treatment, and you have to support the ABC. So mild effects will generally resolve by removing the patient from the source of the contamination and administering supplemental oxygen. So severe exposure will require aggressive oxygen and perhaps ventilation with supplemental oxygen. So always use a BVM or oxygen-powered ventilatory device. So initiate transport immediately if the antidote, antidote by ALS is not available. Next, we're going to talk about biological agents. So biologic agents pose a different issue when used by the by when used as a weapons of mass destruction. Biologic agents can be almost completely undetectable, and most of the diseases caused by these agents will be similar to those of a minor illness. So biologic agents are grouped as viruses, bacteria, neurotoxins, and may spread in, vir in various ways. Dissemination is the means by which a terrorist will spread the agent. A disease vector is the animal that, once affected, spreads disease to the other animal. So I want you guys to remember that. Dissemination is the means by which a terrorist will spread the agent and a disease vector is an animal that spreads disease to another animal. How easily the disease is able to spread from one human to another human is called the communability. So in instances when communicability is high, such as with smallpox, a person is con considered contagious. So incubation is the period of time when the person becoming exposed to the agent and the appearance of the first symptoms. Viruses. Viruses are germs that require a living host to multiply and survive. Once in the body, the virus invades, invades healthy cells and replicates itself to spread through the host. Viruses move from host to host by direct methods such as respiratory droplets or through vectors. So this is smallpox. It's highly contagious. All forms of standard precautions must be used to prevent cross-contamination. Wear gloves, a HEPA filter, and eye protection. Before the rash and blisters show, the illness will start with a high fever and body aches and headaches as a easy, an easy, quick way to differentiate smallpox rash from other skin disorders is to observe the size, shape, and location of the lesions. In smallpox, all lesions are identical in their development. Smallpox blisters begin on the face and extremities and uh, evenly, eventually will move towards the chest and abdomen. The disease is in a most contagious phase when the blisters begin to form. This table shows the characteristics of smallpox.
Okay, so VHF, viral hemorrhagic fevers, consists of a group of diseases called, caused by viruses that include Ebola, Rift Valley, Marab, yellow fever viruses, among others. This group of viruses causes blood in the body to seep out of the tissues and blood vessels. Initially, the patients will have flu-like symptoms, regressing to more serious symptoms such as internal and external hemorrhaging. All standard precautions must be taken when treated in these viruses. And here is a table showing the characteristics of the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Okay, next we're going to talk about the bacteria. So unlike viruses, bacteria do not require a host to multiply and live. Bacteria are much more complex and larger and can grow up to 100 times larger than the largest virus. So uh, most bacterial infections can be fought with antibiotics. Most bacterial infections will generally begin with flu-like symptoms. Inhalation and contagious anthrax um, is caused by a deadly bacterium that lays dormant in a spore. So when exposed to the optimal temperature and moisture, the germ will be released from the spore. The routes of entry are inhalation, uh, cutaneous, and gastro, um, gastrointestinal. So the inhalation form of the pulmonary anthrax is the most deadly and often presents as a severe cold. Pulmonary anthrax is associated with 90% death rate if untreated. Antibiotics can be used to treat anthrax and, uh, successfully. And so this uh, table or this slide illustrates the characteristics of anthrax. Okay, and the plague. So the bubonic and pneumonic, so the plague... Uh, natural vectors are infected uh, rodents and fleas. And the bubonic plague infects the lymphatic system. So when this occurs, the patient's lymph, uh, lymph nodes become infected and they grow. The glands of the nodes will grow large and round and form um, and, um, large. And uh, the glands, um, if left untreated, the infection may spread throughout the whole body and lead to sepsis and death, possibly. And the pneumonic plague um, is a lung infection, also known as the plague pneumonia, that results from inhalation of the plague bacteria. Uh, this form of the disease is contagious and has a much higher death rate than the bubonic form. This figure shows a, a slide showing um, the different lymph nodes. So one in the, in the armpit, and then, of course, in the neck. And this shows the characteristics of the plague. Okay, and next we'll talk about neurotoxins. So neurotoxins are the most deadly substances known to human. These toxins are produced from plants, marine animals, molds, and bacteria. The route of entry is through ingestion, inhalation from aerosols or injection. And unlike viruses and bacteria, they are not contagious and have a faster onset of symptoms. So botulum and toxum, the most potent neurotoxum is botulum, which is produced by bacteria. And when introduced into the body, the neurotoxin affects the nervous system's ability to function. So voluntary muscle control um, uh, stops as the spread, the toxin spreads, and eventually the toxin causes muscle paralysis leading to respiratory arrest. And so this is a slide that lists the characteristics of the botulum toxum. Okay, and then there's ricin. Ricin is derived derived from mash that is left from the castor bean. So when introduced into the body, ricin causes pulmonary edema and respiratory and circulatory failure leading to death. The toxin is quite stable and extremely toxic by the routes of exposure, including inhalation. Um, signs and symptoms of ricin ingestion are the following. So fevers, chills, headaches, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe abdominal cramping, dehydration, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, necrosis of the liver, spleen, kidneys, and GI tract. Signs and symptoms of ricin inhalation are fever, chills, nausea, irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat, profuse sweating, 
headache, nausea, uh, muscle cramps, productive cough, chest pain, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, severe lung infection, cyanosis, seizures, respiratory failure. Treatment is supportive and include both respiratory support and cardiovascular support as needed. And here is a table on the slide list the characteristics of ricin. Okay. Other EMT roles during a, a biologic uh, event. Um, so is syndromic surveillance, and this is basically monitoring patients presenting to emergency departments and alternative care facilities, and it you record um, the call volume. Basically, you're monitoring uh, the use of over-the-counter medicines. You're looking for patients with signs and symptoms that resemble influenza uh, are particularly important. Your quality assurance of dispatch operations you need to be aware of. Unusual numbers of calls for patients with unexplained symptoms or clusters coming in for a particular region or community. So points of distribution, so um, strategic national stockpile. So basically this is where they would um, keep uh, some of the antidotes and vaccines. So these PODs, points of distribution, are existing facilities that are established in the time of need for mass distribution of antidotes, antibiotics, vaccines, and other medicines and supplies. Um, these medications may be released in deliveries called push packs by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Strategic National Stockpile. These push packages have a delivery time of about 12 hours anywhere in the country. EMTs, advanced EMTs and paramedics may be called upon to assist in the delivery of these medications to the public. Your role may include triage, um, treatment, and transport. Radiologic nuclear devices. So, hmm, what is radiation? So, ionizing radiation is emitted in the form of rays or particles. So, this energy can be found in radioactive materials such as rocks and metals. So, radioactive material is any material that emits radiation. So, this material is unstable and it, it attempts to stabilize itself by changing its structure in a natural process called decay. So the energy that is emitted from a strong radio, radiologic source is alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is the x-ray or neutron radiation. So alpha is the least harmful penetrating type and cannot move through most objects. And beta radiation is slightly more penetrating than alpha and requires a layer of clothing to stop it. And gamma rays are far faster and stronger than alpha and beta. So these rays easily penetrate through the human body and require lead or several inches of concrete to prevent penetration. Then there's neutron particles. Those are among the ma most powerful forms of radiation. So neutrons easily penetrate through lead and require several feet of concrete to stop them. So here is a slide that shows um, the different types of, um, of x-rays. Or sorry, of um, radiation. Okay, so sources of radiologic materials. So radiologic materials are generally used for purposes that benefit mankind. So such as medicines or killing germs and food or construction. And so once the radiologic material has been used for this purpose, the material remaining is called radiologic waste. And these materials can be found at hospitals, healthcare facilities, or colleges and universities, or nuclear power plants, or chemical and industrial sites. And so there are real radiologic dispersal devices, so RDD. So an RDD is a container that is designed to disperse radioactive material. A dirty bomb carries the potential to injure victims with not only radioactive material, but also explosive material used to deliver it. So a destructive capability of a dirty bomb is limited to the explosives that are attached to it. So the dirty bomb is an ineffective weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear energy. 
So nuclear energy is artificially made by altering or splitting a radioactive um, atom. So the result is an immense amount of energy that usually takes the form of heat. Nuclear material is used in medicine, weapons, naval vessels, and power plants. So nuclear material gives off all forms of radiation, including neutrons. Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are kept only in secure facilities throughout the world. So the likelihood of a nuclear attack is extremely remote. Since the collapse of the former Soviet Union, the whereabouts of many small nuclear devices are still unknown, though. So these devices, suitcase-sized nuclear weapons, are called special uh, atomic demolition mutant mutants and. SADMs. Some of these are believed to be still missing. Okay, so patients exposed to a known or suspected source of excessive radiation are considered victims of acute radiation toxicity. The effects of radiation exposure will vary depending on the amount of radiation that the patient has received and the route of entry, of course. So radiation can be introduced to the body by all routes of entry as well as through the body. And so some common signs of acute radiation toxicity are listed on 40-11 right here. So this slide lists the common signs of acute radiation toxicity. So medical management of this and being exposed to the radiation source does not make a patient contaminated or radioactive. However, the patients have a radioactive source on their body. They are contaminated and must be initially cared for by a hazmat responder. So once the patient is deconned, you may begin treatment with the ABCs and treat the patient for any burns or trauma. Wear appropriate PPE, secure a plastic bag with body fluids obtained from the patient. So place all body fluids in containers and properly dispose of them with a potential, potentially radioactive waste. So protective measures, there are no suits or protective gear designed to completely shield you from radiation. So the best way to protect yourself is uh, from the effects of radiation is time distance and shielding. So those are the three things. So the best ways are time, distance, and shielding. So time, the less time that you're exposed to the source, the less the effects will be. If you realize that the patient is near radio, a, radiation source, leave the area immediately. Then distance. So radiation is limited in how far it can travel. So depending on the type of radiation, often moving only a few feet is enough to remove you from immediate danger. So make sure that the responder are stationed far enough away from the incident. Then shielding. So always assume that you are dealing with the strongest form of radiation and use concrete shielding between you and yourself in the incident. So once again, the best ways to protect yourself from the effects of radiation are time, distance, and shielding. Okay, so incendiary and explosive devices, they come in various shapes and sizes, and this is what we're going to talk about next. And so incendiary devices are weapons that are used to start fires, terrorists use flamethrowers, chemicals, multi-cocktails, and other explosive devices. So those are incendiary devices. It is important for you to be able to identify an, an object you believe is a potential device. So notify the proper authority and safely evacuate the area. Remember that there are, is the possibility of a secondary device when you are responding to the scene. Mechanisms of injury. So the mechanism of the severity of the wounds primarily depends on the patient's distance from the epicenter of the explosion. Remember, so blast injuries occur in a number of ways. So the primary blast, the secondary blast. So the primary blast, oh, and then there's the tertiary blast and the quad tertiary blast, right? And so the primary blast is um, due solely to the direct effects of the pressure wave on the body. The injury is seen almost exclusively in the hollow organs, and the injury to the lungs is caused by the greatest morbidity and mortality. So then there's the secondary blast. So the secondary blast 
is the penetrating and non-penetrating injury that results from being struck by flying debris, objects, or propelled by the force or the blast or the strike. Then there's the tertiary, so that's the third, and that results from the whole body displacement, so it's the, um, the impact of the environmental objects, so another indirect effect is, um, includes crush injuries of collapse of structures, and then there's the quaternary, so the fourth blast injury, um, and, and any other injury caused by the blast, so including toxic inhalation of combustion gases or burns and medical it, um, the medical emergency like a myocardial infarction sustained while fleeing the scene of an explosion or even a mental health disorder that um, develops immediately after the days or weeks of detonation. So the physics of an explosion. When a substance is detonated, a solid or liquid is chemically converted into large amounts of gases under high pressure with resilient explosion energy release. This generates a pressure pulse in the shape of a spear blast wave and expands in all directions from the point of the explosion. So flying debris and high wave calmly cause conventional blunt and penetrating trauma. Pala organs such as the middle ear, lungs, and the GI tract are most susceptible to pressure changes. The junction between tissues of different densities and exposed tissues such as the head, neck, are prone to injury as well. So the ear and the ear is an organ system most sensitive to blast injuries. So the patient will report ringing or pain in the ears such as loss of hearing and blood may be visible in the ear canal primary pulmonary blast injuries occur as contusions and hemorrhages so patients may report tightness or pain in the chest and may cough up blood and uh, have a um, shortness of breath and other signs of respiratory distress. So subcutaneous emphysema over the chest may be palpated, indicating the, plate, the presence of a pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is common and may require emergen, em, emergency decompression. Solid organs are relatively protected from shockwave injury, but may be injured from secondary missiles or hurled body Hollow organs may be injured by similar mechanisms as lung tissues, so petechiae to large hematomas are the most visible, most visible sign. According to the CDC, blast lung is the most common cause of death from a blast injury. Neurologic injuries and head traumas are also common causes of fatality from blast injuries. So subarachnoid and subdural hematomas are often seen. Permanent and transient neurological deficits may be secondary to concussion or intracerebral bleeding or air embolisms. So instant but transient unconsciousness with uh, with or without retrograde amnesia may be initiated. So bradycardia and hypotension are also common after an intense pressure wave from an explosion. Extremity injuries, including traumatic amputations, are common, and patients may die of massive hemorrhage without rapid application of tourniquets. Okay, so this concludes the chapter 40 terrorism response and disaster management lecture portion. Next is going to be the review questions. Um, and so I will uh, let you uh, review the review questions on your own. And thank you again.